Rosita's dear friend and my friend, uh, Orit. Welcome, Orit. It's wonderful to have you here. And also Dr. Bader's wife, Janan, who joined us in, in the United States. Welcome, Janan. Thank you so much for being here. I uh, hope you're enjoying the fruits of Dr. Bader's retirement from military life. It's really great to have you. That's a whole conversation by itself. Right? Okay. And um, we had the privilege of meeting Dr. Bader after when we visited the Druze village in which he lives. That was really, really wonderful. Speaks to the friendship between him and our organization. Just a little bit of supplementary background in addition to what you heard yesterday. They heard about your bio and, and they learned about your professional background in brief. Uh, but I just want to say a little bit about, about some of uh, Dr. Bader's experiences and what they'll be talking about. Number one, uh, as you know and I'm reiterating, Dr. Bader was deputy head of mission to Haiti. Uh, there are children who bear the name Israel over in Haiti as a consequence of the medical aid that Dr. Bader uh, dispensed there. In the, uh, in the wake of that dreadful, dreadful uh, natural disaster. He was also head of mission in Nepal, uh, head of the medical mission of the Israel Defense Forces in Nepal, when he became the Surgeon General of the Israel Defense Forces. And Dr. Bader also was responsible in coordination with Yael Golan, who was then commander of the Northern Front, who they heard from in the Knesset, who well, sat with Yael in the Knesset. Uh, he was responsible for establishing something that we now feel is de rigueur in Israel, which is a field hospital to assist the injured in combat areas or combat zones or combat adjacent zones. And he did that at the northern border to treat Syrians who were fleeing. They're not technically refugees because Israel wasn't offering permanent refuge, nor did they want to seek permanent refuge. But he treated those who were seeking medical assistance with dire wounds, some of which I think we'll see, as a result of a man-made disaster, namely the Syrian Civil War. And he'll speak about the intelligence aspects that go into repatriating injured individuals from states that have an official enmity with the states of Israel, which is a very delicate situation. But I also want to just say that he was particularly, particularly assistive in as bringing Israel's medical diplomacy, is what I term it, Dr. Bader will give it probably a better term, uh, to the attention of, of medics, medical professionals in the United States of America. He's briefed at the preeminent universities, medical schools in the United States of America. He's also presented grand rounds for preeminent medical <coughs> practitioners. You've heard of the doctors doing his or her rounds, right? When you go to grand rounds is when you present to your peers. <coughs> in an official capacity as part of continued medical <coughs> learning. He's done that across the United States, East Coast and West Coast. And he also briefed the Department of Veterans Affairs under the auspices of David Shulkin about how the Israel Defense Forces deals with post-traumatic stress disorder, how we in our know how might be assisted, and a number of other subjects as well. Uh, it's a great privilege always to hear from him and to learn from him. Uh, and I personally feel a little bit taller each time uh, that I hear him speak. So I just want to welcome him on behalf of me, on behalf of Rosita, and I look forward to learning from him. We're going to be here for about 75 to 90 minutes. If you could hold your questions to the end, please do ask. And uh, finally, as I said before, I, I truly think that Dr. Badr is, is the face of Israel. He is what can be achieved in Israel. And it's my hope that that will find an international platform as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Bader. Thank you very much. I just want to add one more thing. I yes. just want you to know that Dr. Bader also, when he toured in the universities, he faced um, protesters that told him that he's a murderer, that he exchanges parts of bodies, and that's why we kill Palestinians. So he has really faced protests in universities in the United States. So, uh, with your permission, I will start with, uh, with the point that Rosita said uh, finally. Uh, last year, I got uh, a, a, an honorary doctorate from uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And uh, the doctorate was uh, because of my humanitarian actions, because the lectures I gave in uh, Philadelphia and other places. And uh, during that time, there was a, a conflict between Israel and Gaza, Gaza Strip. And actually, even there, there was a, 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 a large number of protests. Students who were learning there, and actually they, they wanted to, uh, to cancel this uh, doctorate of science 
uh, honorary doctorate of science because I'm actually the, 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 the physician or the doctor of the, uh, of the IDF, of the uh, Israel Defense Forces. And uh, I was lucky that the, the dean of the university and director of the university actually didn't, uh, they, 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 let's say they listened to them, but they said we are giving this honorary degree uh, because of the actions, of the humanitarian actions all over the world, of, uh, not only for, of mine, but of, uh, of what, what we have done. So uh, my lecture today is uh, actually three parts. We can skip the last part because we are to, we, we, I would like to, 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 deal, to, to talk with you uh, about the military medicine in uncertain circumstances. And I think what Benjamin said is all of these are uncertain circumstances. We are talking about, uh, let's say, uh, even man-made disasters or, or uh, natural disasters. But I would like to go through this experience to what we have done in the military medicine during the, COVID, during the beginning of COVID-19. And this is the two parts. And the third part, it's about the civilian system in Israel and the COVID-19 and the vaccination in Israel in, in general. If we have time, we'll talk about it. If not, it's OK. Uh, another point that is very important, I think it's uh, 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 the fact that uh, uh, last year, uh, excuse me, two years ago, uh, I was in the United <coughs> Nations, and I was the first, and uh, until now, the only officer in uniform who is standing in the, in the General Assembly of the United Nations and talking about uh, humanitarian missions and peacekeeping uh, um, uh, forces. So I start with the with the oath of the medical of the of the medical corps, and actually this is the oath taken by all the personnel in the medical corps. And what's what is highlighted here is to extend the helping hand to everybody. And this line is a very important line that we are teaching our uh, students, our medics, our paramedics, our physicians in the military academy that whenever there is a need, we are there. Whenever there is a need, we have to be there to give, to, to, give, uh, to extend a happy hand. And it's written here with a friend or foil. So this is what we are talking about. And this is the history of the humanitarian missions that the state of Israel have done. You see, since 1953, <coughs> to the last one in two, uh, 2021. The, the, the State of Israel was established in 1948. That means at the age of three years, the State of Israel, a very young State of Israel, was the first time that the State of Israel decided to give a humanitarian mission to one of the disasters were in, in Greece, in one of the islands of Greece. That's right, it was a very small and, uh, and, and, and minor uh, uh, humanitarian mission, but it was the decision that the State of Israel will go whenever there is a need for, for us and giving a, 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 a helping hand. So this was the first one. Uh, as Benjamin said, I was in, uh, in, in Haiti as a pediatrician. I was in, uh, of course, I, I, I commanded, I built the whole, uh, the whole system of giving the uh, treatment for the, uh, for the uh, Syrians in a hostel board, and I will uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, and in uh, Nepal 2015, I was the commander of this, uh, of this mission. In between, uh, in 2003, there was a, a, a tsunami in, in Thailand. I also went there, but actually it's not a humanitarian mission because it was like I went there to see whether there is a, a need for a humanitarian mission. Uh, as a consulting team, we went there with a few, uh, uh, with, we were uh, uh, six uh, uh, professionals who went there and actually we decided that there was no need for a humanitarian mission for a field hospital uh, in Haiti. So this is the, uh, the experience of the state, the state of Israel in general. And when we are talking about the last past or 20, uh, uh, last past or 12 years, we are going to, to talk about three or four <coughs> of, uh, of these uh, uh, humanitarian missions. Uh, and we'll start with, uh, with Haiti 2010. You see that uh, it's a humanitarian, it's a, it's a natural disaster, and you see that, sorry for the, for the picture, but it's okay, that within 45 seconds, Thousands of people, millions of people were, 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 uh, were killed in this, uh, in this uh, uh, um, um, earthquake. And you see the pictures here? This is what we saw at the roads of, of Haiti, of, uh, of Porto, Porto Prince. And you have to come there and to try to help, to try to save lives. And we will talk about the importance of that. In the Philippines 2013, uh, again, uh, a natural disaster. And you see, this is the uh, satellite of, uh, of Tacloban, one of the cities there, before the, uh, um, 
the tsunami there, and this is the same photo after that. So the whole city was destroyed. And you can imagine the, uh, uh, what happened there. Again in 2015 in Nepal, you see the numbers, you see it, but within a few seconds, less than one minute, two minutes, uh, the whole system is broken, and you see again uh, the photos from, uh, from Nepal. This is in, in Kathmandu, in, in, the, in, the, in the capital city of, uh, of Nepal. Uh, and of course the Syrian, which is totally different, it's a man-made disaster, and, sorry, it's a man-made disaster, and according to what was written in the United Nations, that this is uh, actually the biggest humanitarian emergency of our, our era. This is what happened. You, uh, 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 you might remember the numbers, millions of people, of, of Syrian people, were fled from the country. Uh, thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were, were killed. And actually we have to decide whether to treat or not treat. And what's the answer? To treat. Whenever there is a need for us, we are there. This is, uh, I'm sorry for the picture, but there are, let's say, Syrians that I have personally treated them on the border in one of the, one of the field field hospitals that we have there, and of course in two uh, 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 Israel hospitals in, uh, in the north part of, the, of, uh, of Israel. This guy, you see him, actually, it's, I'm, I'm also, I, I'm all, all the time I'm asking myself how he survived the two or three hours until he arrived the border. And he was lucky that he arrived alive to the border. We have treated him in the field hospital. Of course, it's not a treatment for a field hospital. We have to transfer him in, uh, uh, directly to one of the hospitals where we have a neurosurgery, a plastic surgery, an ENT. And actually, he was treated there for almost four months. And this is the result. This is what have done in Syria. This is what have done in, in Israel. This is the result. The other guy is a 13 years old child who was playing in the, in the, at, at his home with, the, with a friend of him, and actually a bomb was exploded, and his, uh, his friend was, uh, was killed at the, at the scene, and he was lucky to be suffering from only two amputations of his legs, a partial amputation of one of the hands, and a, a complex fracture of the other hand. Again. I wonder how he, dis how he survived the one and a half hours between his village to the border and he arrived alive to the border. We have treated him in the, in the field hospital and of course we, uh, we transferred, uh, transferred him to the, uh, to the Ziv hospital in Tzfat. He was treated here, there for, at the beginning, four and a half months. With a lot of operations, you can, you can imagine how difficult to treat these things with, uh, 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 with, uh, with infections, with reinfections, and etc. And actually, we decided at one point, we decided to discharge him back to Syria. Uh, his mother was with him all the time. And you can understand that actually, we not only treated the child, but we took care also from his mother. And at that point, when we decided, actually, there was nothing more to do with this, uh, this child, we decided to, to, uh, to discharge him back to Syria. Uh, and then uh, uh, his mother said, uh, going back to Syria in this situation is, uh, is killing the child. Mm. And at that point, we thought again, what, what can be done? And actually, with a lot of volunteers, with a lot of uh, uh, good people, who thought about uh, donations and etc. Because it's not, it's not a thing that you can offer in a, 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 in public hospitals. And I'm talking about the professors. It's a very expensive professors. It's not part of the treatment that we are giving to our citizens. So that's the point that uh, we, we didn't thought even to give a professors for this child. But when his mother said what what she said. And when we have a, a lot of volunteers that, that could uh, 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 give money to buy this prothesis, very expensive prothesis, he stayed another one and a half month in the hospital, uh, taking care of the prothesis, and actually he went back to Syria with the prothesis and learning how to, how to walk. And this is the point that his mother said, okay, now he can survive in Syria. So this is 
the, the things that we are doing in general in the, in the humanitarian missions. And if I'm, I'm going to summarize uh, um, the lessons that we are learning from humanitarian missions in general, I can uh, um, focus on a couple of, uh, of, of lessons there. First of all, leadership. And when I say leadership, I mean that a, 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 a country has to decide whether to give treatment or not give treatment, whether to give humanitarian missions or not give, or, or not give humanitarian missions. I was in the Knesset uh, uh, this week. We uh, were dealing uh, about humanitarian missions to, uh, uh, to, to, to areas of conflict. All of us are, are uh, 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 familiar with what is happening in Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, uh, and etc. But uh, there's another places in the world that there are uh, conflicts and actually the state of Israel is, is, is talking about whether to send uh, humanitarian missions there or not, whether to send help or not. And one of the, one of the things that we were dealing about is the, is the Ethiopian country. Also there, there is, there is a, a conflict and actually uh, I was in a Knesset as a professional uh, to, to, to deal with uh, what are the things that we can do for, the, uh, for other countries when there is a, a need for us. So the first, uh, the first uh, lesson is leadership to decide that if you want to wanna help or not. And uh, as I said before, the, uh, the decision of the State of Israel is whenever there is, there is a need for us, we are going to be there. Whenever there is a need for us, we are going to extend the helping hand. And of course, being there as soon as possible and as, you say, as, you, uh, 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 as we mentioned before, the distance is not a matter. The borders are not a matter. We extend the helping hand for Syria, which is a hostile border, as Benjamin said. We are not in relation with, with Syria. It's a state of war. And even though we decided that there is a need for us and we are going to be there. And of course, the distance, we are, let's say that between Israel and, and Haiti is more than 13 hours. Between here and in Nepal, it's more than 15 hours. So the distance and the borders are not uh, are not a barrier, and uh, and you see here the timeline of uh, of what we have. I said to be there as soon as possible. When we came back from uh, when we came back from sorry. when we came back from uh, uh, from Haiti, we wanted to discuss whether we. We have a good uh, 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 a good work done or not. So we just uh, 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 discussed the whole time from the from the earthquake until the time that our field hospital was established, until the first one uh, entered the field hospital. And we saw here that within 80, 89 hours, the field hospital was already uh, uh, working in uh, in Port au Prince, which is amazing. <laughs> And you have to understand that this time, for example, when we, when we were waiting, is waiting for the final permission that we can fly to, uh, uh, to Haiti and, uh, and, be, and being there. And uh, you see that here from the, uh, the, team the, the, the earthquake to the team dispatch, it's a, it's a very short, short time. And in the military, even, where is the, even when, when we are doing a good job, we are going back and discussing what was good and whether we can improve it for the next time. And this is what we have done. And, uh, and you see here, sorry, that in, uh, in Nepal, we did the same timeline, and we had it within 82 hours between the earthquake to the, uh, to the time that the hospital was ready to receive the first, uh, the first uh, 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 patient. The other one is a tailor-made hospital, or the tailor-made decision, or the tailor-made solution. It's totally different sometimes that solution that we are going to give to Syria or to Haiti, uh, to Haiti or to, uh, to the Philippines. And what's important is to try to, uh, 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 to build a solution which give the, uh, um, it, to, give, to, to build the, um, the, the hospital, which, which give the solution to the, to the problem itself. And we are, when we are going to, uh, to do that, we of course have to use 
uh, our prior experience and to think a little bit different from what we are uh, 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 thinking in the in the daily manner in the, in the hospitals here in Israel. So when we are going to deal with the with the solution, uh, we have to decide whether we are going to treat independently or sharing with the hospitals in the, in, the, in the affected country, whether we are going to deal with sick patients or injured patients, and that differs, of course. If, for example, we are talking about uh, the pandemic, we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit of, uh, later then. We do not have, uh, uh, we do not, there's no, no need for orthopedics or surgeons or, or whatever. And when that disaster is more like an earthquake, so we have to focus in uh, injured people. So this is the, uh, the things that we have to deal. And if you see that uh, in, in earthquake, in Haiti earthquake, uh, because most of the hospitals, most of the local hospitals were, were partially destroyed and part of them were out of action. So we have to decide to work totally independent in the country. And of course, we focused more in the injured people. Uh, in the Philippines, for example, mm -hmm. When we discussed the solution, the solution that we can give with the, with the Philippines, they asked us to work in collaboration with the local clinics or, or, or hospitals that they have there. Uh, they, they need us for uh, personnel and for equipment. So that was the reason that actually we decided to work in a different, uh, different uh, manner. Uh, and then in Nepal, earthquake was most of the, most of, most of, uh, uh, more or less, the same as in, uh, in, uh, in Haiti, except of the fact that part of the hospitals were still operating. And actually that was the decision, that was the, the, uh, the reason that we decided to work in collaboration with one of the military hospitals in, uh, in, the, in the center of, uh, um, of Kathmandu. Uh, and this is, I said, using our prior experience, this is the experience of the center of Israel. Beside the uh, more than uh, 15 humanitarian missions that we have done, we are training all the time. We are practicing our, our teams. And you have to understand that actually, the, when we are talking the field hospital, the state of Israel, is not a military unit that the field hospital can uh, go whenever there is a need. The field hospital in the state of Israel is actually uh, is a mixture of, uh, uh, of uh, people who are serving in the military, as physicians, as medics, as nurses, as etc., and a huge number, more than two thirds of them, who are actually working in the civilian hospitals, and we are recruiting them from the civilian hospitals and going with with us at the, uh, to the to the to to this mission. Uh, and you see, whenever there is a uh, there is a drill, we are gathering all these people from the civilian hospitals, from the military units, and actually we are working together in order to, uh, to improve our uh, uh, possibility of working together in emergency situation. In uh, 2018 was the first time that the field hospital, the Israeli field hospital, has a drill outside the country. As part of the, of the MODEX, uh, which is a, a European uh, a union that dealing with this, uh, these things, and actually it was the, field, the Israel field hospital was the role <coughs> model of the field hospitals working there. A collaboration. Beside the collaboration that I said uh, before with the, in the national uh, era, we are talking about collaboration between the civilian system, the military system. I'm talking about collaboration nationally and internationally. We are working uh, uh, with, uh, with the United Nations. We were working with, with other field hospitals with, uh, that uh, were there. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about collaboration is, for example, the nationally uh, state and national level collaboration. There is no direct flights between Israel and, uh, and Haiti. There are no direct flights between Israel and, uh, and Nepal. <coughs> when there's a disaster, as I mentioned before, time is money, and we have to be there as soon as possible. So part of the collaboration is uh, talking with the head of the El Al, which the uh, national uh, airline, uh, uh, the Israeli national air airlines, and actually uh, bringing uh, an airplanes directly to going directly from Israel <coughs> to uh, Port-au-Prince or to Kathmandu in this uh, uh, situation. And another uh, uh, point of collaboration is that, as I mentioned before, the military-civilian collaboration. So 
people, for example, our reserve people. He is the head of the intensive care unit in one of the big hospitals in Israel. And actually, whenever there is a need for, for him, he's telling his manager, okay, I'm, I'll not be here for the next two or three weeks, and I'm going to the military mission. Uh, she's a military nurse, and she's working there, and of course, a lot of uh, uh, volunteers that uh, were working with, with us. And if we summarize the uh, hospital staff that, for example, that we were in, uh, in, uh, in Nepal, this is the staff, almost 125, 26 people, from the logistic part, from the physicians, nurses. So actually, this, uh, this personnel is the personnel who is going to, uh, uh, to operate the field hospital. And as I mentioned before, it's very important for us to be totally independent. So we are dealing with the logistic part. We are dealing with the, even for the uh, uh, mental health, the photographer, uh, the force protection, or whatever. So all of these uh, personnel are part of the field hospital. In general, the, uh, the medical corps is not going alone to these missions. They are going as part of a bigger mission uh, led by the Home Front Command. So beside these 126 people who are dealing, who are operating the field hospital, in general there are uh, almost one, 150 or, or even more than that uh, personnel from the Home Front Command who are actually dealing with rescue and uh, 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 search and, uh, and rescue, bringing the, the injury to the, our field hospital and working to, with collaboration uh, with them. Beside these numbers, there are a lot, uh, a large number of volunteers, and volunteers could be people from the local countries, could be people from other countries who came to the affected area, and actually they have, do not have the ability to work uh, alone. For example, in, in Haiti, we have a, a Colombian team who came as, a, 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 as, a, as an operating room, and they thought that they could work in one of the local hospitals. But because I, as I already mentioned, that the local hospitals were almost destroyed, so actually there was a very uh, experienced team, a military experienced team in the Colombian, uh, 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 from Colombia, and actually they were searching for a hospital to work with them. And we found, they found our field hospital, and they worked with collaboration with us as, a, uh, as another unit of, uh, of uh, uh, operating unit. So this is part of the collaboration. Of course, we have to deal with, uh, with the permissions that they have. We have to be sure that actually they are working according to our, uh, uh, to our code of, uh, of work. And besides, I say there are, almost always there are crazy people who are seeking for volunteers. Since both of them are my friends, so I can, uh, can, can, can say that they are crazy. Not because they are my friends. Uh, Dr. Adi Klein is the head of the pediatric department in Hillel Yafi. I worked as a, uh, I was a deputy, deputy CEO of the Hillel Yafi uh, Medical Center uh, a couple of years ago. And when she heard about uh, uh, the delegation to Nepal, and when she heard that I'm commanding uh, this mission, uh, she, she, uh, she called me and said, I'm going to be as one of the pediatricians that we're going to this mission. I said, I'm sorry, I already have my pediatricians. <laughs> you are not enrolled to the military. She was, she, she didn't have, reser she, she, she didn't have a, a, a reserve service since, let's say, 20 years ago. So actually, she's not part of our team. And I said, thank you very much. If there, if there will be a need, I'll call you. What we say, don't call us, we call you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went. When I was in Kathmandu, uh, I got a, a text message telling me that uh, Tarif Shalom, I'm already in, uh, in the way to... Uh,